If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. Good afternoon and welcome to the show. I'm Lee Meckley, Director of Radio Outreach for Christian Answers, along with Jim Tungate. Today we have a really good show for you. Um, our topic for today is going to be another area which is discussed quite often and is is not really dealt with. In, in fact, I, I guess the, the inspiration for today's show came from a debate mm-hmm. that uh, took place between uh, Dwayne, Dwayne Gish of ICR and Hugh Ross. But the, the subject was the age of the earth. Now, both of these gentlemen are creationists. Mm-hmm. And, but there's a debate where Dwayne Gish is holding to the, what's called the young earth position, which would affirm uh, about a 10,000-year-old age right. for the earth. And Hugh Ross, who would be much more sympathetic to the arguments made by evolutionists otherwise, uh, mm-hmm. that the, the earth and the universe are billions and billions of years old. Um, and both of them are trying to justify their position uh, according to scripture and according to science. Now, this there's two things that seem to be missing in this discussion. And the first one is, uh, in this particular debate, and let me say Dwayne Gish is an excellent debater. I mean, he is just a bulldog and has been a tremendous asset to uh, the Institute for Creation Research. Right. But this is one debate that I've seen where I felt like he really came up short. And the problem was, he was discussing, of course, Hugh Ross is, is an astrophysicist. And he was right. making his arguments from um, his field of, of, of expertise. And... Um, Dwayne Gish was attempting to answer him in this area. Now, Dwayne Gish is not an astrophysicist. Right. And it was obvious from, you know, no fault of his, it was just obvious from the discussion that he was not, he was out of his league. But well, we're going to come from this from a different angle, aren't right, we? Right, right. And this is what I thought was missing, was that the discussion was not held exegetically, or very limited. And, right. and w- what I mean by that is, let's go to Scripture, and let's find out from Scripture how old the earth is. Now, Hugh Ross has certain things that he will say about what Scripture says, and the passages mm-hmm. that would apparently indicate a young earth, and why he doesn't feel like that that's, you know, he feels his position is biblical. But this was not discussed, you know, as far as let's 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 do an extensive exegesis of the text because mm-hmm. if scripture says that we've got a young earth, then what anybody wants to say from astrophysics is doesn't matter. Right. It's it, it's irrelevant. Well anyway, we're gonna get into that today. And um our guest is Charlie Clough. Now uh Charlie Clough has a um a bachelor's in mathematics from Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He also served in the U.S. Air Force as a weather officer, then attended Dallas Seminary, graduating with a master's in theology. He's been a member of Creation Research Society since its founding in 1964. He also has pastored a Bible church, studied at- at- atmospheric science at Texas Tech University, uh, obtaining an M.S. in geosciences, and has worked as a civilian supervisory meteorologist with the U.S. Army at uh, Aberdeen Pro- Proving Ground since 1982. has a number of, uh, of publications out, um, or a number of things that he has published, uh, giving the answer, laying the foundation, the dawn of the kingdom, a um, number of things that uh, um, I was looking for. Oh, yes, here's what I was looking for. A book uh, by Donald DeYoung, which uh, has been put out quite a, or promoted quite uh-huh. a bit by ICR, Weather and the Bible. And he has um, uh, helped helped uh, Don DeYoung edit that. So, say, saying all that, Charlie, uh, how are you this afternoon? How are you, Lee? Oh, just fine. Looking forward to the discussion. Uh, we've only got a few minutes uh, uh, before the break comes up, so I just want to basically uh, set up what we're going to be talking about. Uh, even in young Earth um, creationist circles, there seems to be a... A, a hesitance towards actually saying how old the earth is. I quite often hear people say, well, okay, you're a young, er- young earther. How old do you think the world is? And they will say, well, we feel like uh, the geologic 
time clocks and so forth like that would seem to indicate an age of about 10,000 years or so. Uh, none of them want to be accused of holding to Usher's number. And so none of them want to actually, or it seems, none of them want to go to the text and see how old does the Bible say the earth really is. Now, your position is that we can actually go to the text of Scripture and find out what the age of the earth is. Yes, yeah, so at least within <clears throat> very small limits, right. variation. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what I wanted to, uh, to talk about today, and I also want to talk about several claims that are made by Hugh Ross and several other people from the old earth camp, which would say that the, the texts of Scripture that young earth creationists use to indicate that the the world is, is relatively young, are not really saying that, that they've been misinterpreted. And uh, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the, um, the Hebrew word yom. We're going to be uh, talking about the genealogies and so many things that are uh, brought up to attempt to, um, to demonstrate that scriptures not, in fact, demand, the text does not demand a young earth. I'm Lee Meckley, along with Jim Tungate, and uh, Jim and I are... Now, wait a minute, Lee. Does that mean we're astrologists? Uh, uh, no. Jim no. and I? <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me clarify that. Jim and I... Well, l let's just use the bad English. Me and Jim are, uh, are speaking with Charlie Clough, and he has degrees in theology from Dallas Seminary and also uh, meteorology, and we're talking about the subject of... Uh, of the age of the earth from an exegetical viewpoint. We're not going to be getting into, uh, or at least not extensively, getting into geologic time clocks and so forth. We're interested in finding out what the text says right. about the age of the earth. Now, uh, before we get into that, uh, let's talk about Usher's number real briefly. Okay. Uh, Usher's numbers derive, derived uh, from a gentleman named James Usher, who uh, lived back in uh, from 1581 to 1656, and he was an Irish Protestant. And he developed, uh, this is what he's best known for, uh, the chronology in Scripture that dates creation at some point around 4004 B.C. Mm -hmm. And as I understand it, uh, he originally had d done this for the purpose of finding out when the second coming was going to be. He was a date right. setter, um, if I'm not mistaken. But at any rate, this is a number that is seems universally held in low esteem, let's say. There's there's the secularists who obviously balk at it. And even in Christian circles, you know, people say that you know it's it's nonsense, you know, why are we paying attention it's to this? It's not person? important. Right. Uh, uh Charlie, what is your uh, response to response to this, Usher's number? Well, I think that uh, first of all, uh people who make fun of Usher's number uh don't realize who Usher really was. Um the Evangelical Dictionary of Theology points out that he was the only one of six, or he actually was in a group of six theologians that were allowed to dress Parliament and the King in his time. He was a Hebrew scholar. Um, he was a man who very well acquainted with the text. Um, and it's interesting, for example, Hugh Ross in his book points out that uh, Usher probably was misled by the English text of the King James Version. And, and, and it's, that's typical of the attitude toward Usher, um, and it's just ignorant, because Usher uh, knew Hebrew very well. Um, if anything, uh, he, the English text of the Bible would not have been any source of a problem for Usher. Um, Usher just approached the text as any straightforward reader would approach the text. Um, maybe we can blame him for making into uh, several decisions along the way about deducing gaps or the presence of certain textual traditions and that sort of thing. But uh, when Usher said the, there's only about 6,000 years there, uh, 4,000 B.C., um, you, can't, you can't go much beyond those numbers um, without having some serious interpretation problems with the text. And you either have to go with a very uh, uh, liberal view of days of uh, Genesis, or you have to uh, put enormous numbers of gaps in the genealogies. Now, Usher's number is being described as simply Usher added up the genealogies to come up with the age of the earth, and the criticism, at least from evangelical circles, has been that that's, you can't do that, that there's gaps in the genealogies, they're not meant to be exhaustive, and so forth. And quite often, I will hear... Um, 
this demonstrated by pointing to the genealogies, I believe, in Matthew and Luke, pointing out that many times it will say, so-and-so was the son of so-and-so, and if you actually look at the text, you'll find out that he was, you know, a great-great-grandson of this person. In other words, they were just taking prominent people, and they were not plugging in all the people in between, and therefore the genealogies have gaps in them, and the age of the earth is by necessity going to be much older than what you would seem to come up with by simply adding up the genealogies. Is that, um, is that accurate? Oh, yeah, that's, that's the usual approach. Um, there's some problems with that approach uh, because, first of all, and just and just as a general general caveat about this whole issue problem of, of dating uh, with the genealogies, <clears throat> remember that in dating with the genealogies, you're dating Adam. Um, and some Christians uh, have in the past dated Adam firmly and then simply bypassed the implication by saying, well, Adam was a late creation. We can accept evolutionary premises uh, and simply say there were pre-Adamic men and so forth. So keep in mind that when we deal with genealogies, we are linking our present time to the creation of Adam. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, it's not an all-encompassing um, thing, in other words. Uh, but, but let's face it, the real reason why we're all having trouble with Usher's numbers is simply because of the entire framework of cosmology that's developed in the West in the last three or four hundred years uh, that shows long age spans for the universe. And that's the real reason, um, whether it's in archaeology, geology, or something else. Um, but the problem is the text has limits. And we can say, yes, there are gaps. Some, the word Hebrew verb to begat isn't always literally the direct descendant. That's correct. But remember that in Matthew and the other places where these gaps uh, occur, they, we know they occur only because the scripture elsewhere tells us about the gaps. Mm. Mm. So the, the, the problem is, what other scripture do you have to suspect there are gaps in Genesis 5 and 11? Um, the Matthew one, we know there are, there's, a, there's a, an interpretation problem there at several places because we have the Old Testament text. So the question is, what other text, what other reason from scripture do you have to doubt the comp- completeness of the genealogies of 5 and 11? What would it be... Uh proper to deduce from the fact that being that there are gaps in the Matthew and Luke passages that we can assume that there's also gaps in the Genesis 5 and 11 passages that we just don't know about. Well, you could make that uh, assumption except if you were just a naive reader who hadn't been reading Scientific American. Uh, and didn't know about the uh, enormous age that is claimed by historical science at the present time, um, after reading the text of Genesis 5, particularly with the age data in it, uh, there's, a, there's a very tight formula that's used in those chapters. So-and-so lived X number of years, begat so-and-so, lived Y years, and all the number of his days was X plus Y. There's an enormous amount of care so taken. It- it's not even the same construction as the, as the Matthew and, and Lucan passages. That's correct. Now, there is one place that critics will point to, and it's uh, the second Canaan name that occurs in Luke 3.36. And they say, well, there, see, we do have scripture that uh, seems to hint that the uh, genealogies uh, in Genesis are, are limited or incomplete. Um, that is a problem. Uh, the Septuagint version of Genesis does have that extra name in there uh, in Genesis. However, interestingly, uh, the other place where that genealogy occurs in the Old Testament is found in First Chronicles, uh, chapter one, and the Septuagintal text in First Chronicles one does not have that second Canaan name. It agrees with the Hebrew Masoretic text. So, uh, and, besides, and also, uh, one of the textual traditions behind the New Testament, Codex D. And Luke 3.36 does not have that second name. So even uh, when you're hard-pressed to find some scripture that would collide uh, with the straightforward interpretation of Genesis 5 to 11, the most you can really come up with is textual variance of mm-hmm. the, you know, between the Hebrew and the Greek uh, the textual traditions. Mm-hmm. Well, okay, uh, let's assume for the moment that the 
Genesis 5 and 11 genealogies are exhaustive and that they are meant to actually convey a, um, uh, uh, an actual uh, chronological uh, order to things. Assuming that, where does that take us up to? Uh, what point does the, um, does the Genesis 11 text cut off and we have to go to other genealogies to complete our entire biblical chronology? Well, you, you get, Genesis takes you up to Terah, the father of Abraham, and uh, then you start uh, crossing over and building your genealogies from data given the rest of Genesis on up through Exodus and on down. And, and besides, by the time you get to Abraham, you, you've got some good, strong anchors. Um, there's not too much slippage. The only two areas where you have problems in biblical chronology uh, that are rather serious uh, after Abraham is in the duration of Israel's bondage in Egypt, mm -hmm. and then there's some debate about the uh, length of the reign of the judges, whether they were, some of them were co-reigning at the same time, or whether they were in sequence. Well, uh, excuse me, I didn't mean to interrupt, but the, I thought that Paul said, and I can't remember where the reference is, but I thought Paul actually gives a 430 years, I believe, from the time of Abraham to the law. Is, is, is yeah, the, but there's been a debate over that, Lee, because... Uh, there are some problems with uh, how wh whether he's talking about uh, a um, the, the time of the confirmation of the covenant is I believe the terms he uses. In I see. And the question is whether that was the confirmation of the Abrahamic covenant to Jacob or whether that was the confirmation of the Abrahamic covenant to Abraham. Mm -hmm. and, and there is an argument in there. Uh, there are some discussions uh, about the duration of Israel's bondage and mm -hmm. the duration between the Exodus and the Temple. And even these discussions, we're only talking a couple of centuries here. I mean, these, these gaps are insignificant as far as reconciling Genesis with, uh, with the historical science view of the past. So our debate mainly focuses on the genealogies in Genesis 5 through 11. Yes, the question is ultimately uh, whether, uh, if we take a straightforward view of the text, and we, we look at this, these genealogies, we come out with a date close to that of Usher. We can debate. Uh, the Septuagint had slightly different dates, so you might have to modify Usher's date by uh, as much as a thousand years or so. But again, even a thousand years, uh, as far as reconciling the scripture to uh, the secular histories concept, is, um, is a drop in the bucket. So by, by just simply going to the text, uh, we, we have Usher's uh, chronology fixed within an order of magnitude. Okay, let, let me go back to something we mentioned earlier, which is our uh, presuppositions in discussing this. We're going back to Adam, and we're saying that, that you go back to the beginning of Adam. You're going back, essentially, to the beginning of the world. Now, there are a couple of theories of course, one of them is the now famous gap theory, which says that there is a gap between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. What are the merits of that, of that theory? Uh, I, I think, Lee, the best way of answering that is to put it in historical perspective. Um, the, in the history of the church, going all the way back to the time of the apostles, uh, there's very little evidence of people seriously taking a non-traditional view of Genesis, that is, of putting a gap in there or of making the days of Genesis 1 anything but normal days. Now, it's true, Augustine said a few things. There were some people in Alexandria in the more allegorical school of interpretation, uh, such as Philo, uh, Clement, and Origen. But generally speaking, the church... Uh, held to what we would call a very a straightforward, uh, naive, if you will, uh, reading of the text. And that uh, not only human history was limited by the genealogy from the, past, from the present backwards to Adam, but that the earth history was short. And it wasn't really until around 1700 and the gradual awareness that historical science was developing a framework that didn't seem to fit this that beginning in 1700 and from 1700 on to 1850, uh, men struggled with this problem. I mean, when we he hear about the debates, as you, you mentioned in the pre program earlier uh, with Hugh Ross, uh, the, the content of the debate today has not changed fundamentally from that uh, of two centuries ago. From 1700 to 1850, 
Christians tried to make room for a long earth history. And the gap idea and the idea that the days were ages go all the way back to that time period. Hmm. Um, th this is not something new. This is not an adjustment by 20th century fundamentalists. It goes back many centuries. Uh, and then from 1850 on to about 1921, uh, the emphasis then was, uh-oh, we got two problems, not one. Not only do we have to make room in Genesis for an, a long Earth history, but now we've got to make room for a long human history, because uh, by that time, anthropology uh, had been finding uh, fossil men and so forth. So there are two questions to this, and it was the second question, the long human history, that raised the issue of the genealogical gaps. The long Earth history between 1700 and 1850 that was where the long days came in and the gap view came in. So this would actually be a separate theory that there were pre-Adamic uh, humanoids or soulless creatures or however they've been described. This is actually a, a separate theory, technically from the gap theory, to solve a separate perceived problem. That, uh, the pre-Adamic human, uh, humanoids uh, w w would, would be connected with some gap people and uh, not others. Uh, yeah, the, the pre-Adamic idea is simply to, to, to sidestep the implication of a tight genealogy. Okay, well, I want to talk about that some more, but right now we have a caller. Alan, you're on the air. What's on your mind? Oh, uh, yeah, thanks a lot, and uh, I really appreciate you having a, a scholar on like uh, Charles. Thank Clough. you for calling. How do you spell your last name, Charles? Uh, C-L-O-U-G-H. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Have you, I've been listening, but I haven't heard you actually say what what your estimate is of the uh, age of, let's say, first of all, the, the time frame from Adam to the present and then from the creation of the universe to the present. All right, I think the, uh, I would gen generally go along with, with an Usher scale. Uh, the reason I, I don't pin myself down to exactly his date is because uh, I'm still puzzled by some of the textual variants between the Septuagint and the Masoretic text. Um, but I, I just haven't emphasized that too much in my thinking because the big, big conflict we've got going isn't going to be resolved by fudging a few hundred years in the genealogies. We've got bigger problems than that. So you would say Usher's number of 4004 B.C. plus or minus 1,000 years? Yeah, I would say so. That help, Alan? Uh... Well, uh, there are two time frames. Are you saying from Adam to the present is about 6,000 years? Yeah. Okay, and then what about from the creation of the universe to the present? Okay, from the creation of the universe to the present, uh, my personal feeling is that it's, it's, it's a literal genesis. Uh, I respect those who differ with me uh, that do hold to a longer Earth history, but uh, my personal opinion, and I, I've come personally from being a theistic evolutionist to a progressive creationist now to a, as I've gotten older, to a uh, more of a fundamentalist position, yeah. that the, the text simply binds me to a very, very young universe. So you would say that, that when the Bible says that the stars and the sun and the moon were created, that is literally when they were created in that time span that it's mentioned there. That's correct. And okay. that there wasn't an indeterminate amount of time. No. Okay. Can I have one more question? Sure. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, you know, you were talking about, uh, well, uh, let's say... Uh, before, uh, you know, back when evolution was, uh, are you still there? Yes. Sure. Okay. Um, back when evolution was more believable, you know, before we had uh, molecular biology and DNA research and all that sort of thing, uh, you talk, you, there was talk about soulless creatures uh, evolving into creatures who have souls. Um, what impact has... Uh, you know, our knowledge of DNA, we can now go back and sort of do the DNA analysis on a lot of these things and find out well, that, you know, some of, these, uh, some of these bones came from monkeys and other bones have come from human beings that have the same DNA that we have today. Uh, mm -hmm. Has that in impacted research? Um, in, I've been in with the creation uh, circles, creation of circles now for a number of years, and... Uh, what, where that has impacted the most is in affirming the inviability of the Genesis kinds. Yes. It's fundamental in Genesis that, the, the, and, and I think we need to be very careful here because 
Genesis keeps on saying it shall be reproduced after their kind. There are limits to variation. Exactly. It's a and straitjacket. This, this limitation and variation is philosophically very critical because paganism has traditionally held to a continuity of being between the gods, matter, uh, animals, and man. It, it, we're all it's part of the same goo. And uh, Genesis insists not that's not true. There's a true inherent diversity. And those kinds are critical theologically because Paul builds resurrection on them in 1 Corinthians 15. So DNA studies have impacted in that area, at least that, from what I know. Okay, and one more uh, question, and that has to do, and this is my last one. I really appreciate the opportunity. Sure. Uh, and that has to do with the idea of a soul. Uh, it's my understanding that you can be a Christian and believe in the resurrection and, and you know, all of that without believing that there is some immortal soul making up uh, the combination of flesh and immortal soul making up man, that man could be all flesh, uh, and that, that um, the, the question that I have is, if, if you do believe in the immortal soul that sort of leaves the body when you die, uh, how does that soul uh, think because it has no brain, how does it see because it has no eyes, and how does it hear because it has no ears? Uh, let me quickly clarify your, your point, Alan. Would, would you be coming from the perspective of soul sleep, that the body uh, generates the soul, and that when we die, uh, we are in a state of sleep, and that when we are resurrected, this is, this is when we kind of come back into consciousness? No, the, uh, the idea here would be that, that we are exactly what you see. You know, we are just flesh and blood, just like Adam you know, in the Bible it says, from dust thou art, to dust thou shalt return. And then right. a Abraham, when he was pleading for Sodom and Gomorrah, he was saying, God, why, why should you listen to me? I am just dust. He didn't say, I am dust and some immortal soul. But in Genesis 2, 7, it says that man became a living soul. Well, uh, yes, but uh, it also... Well, anyhow, I don't want to get into the... the yeah, your question... My right. question is, there, there are plenty of people, including Hebrew scholars, who say that the word soul that we think of today is more of a, a Greek platonic concept than a Hebrew concept. But anyhow, my question is this, is uh, if you do believe there is an immortal soul that makes up the combination, that makes up a human being, an immortal soul and a body, when, when, when people die and the soul departs the body, how does that soul, you know, we're not angels. Angels are spirit people. They can, are spirit creatures. They can think and see and hear and everything without senses. But we, we are not angels. We are flesh and blood. Charles, what would you say to that? Well, he, he, he's right in that we can read into the Hebrew uh, Greek ideas that came in later. But uh, again, looking at the to the text, we find uh, passages in the Bible that, for example, the Saul comes up under the case of the witch of Endor. And um, uh, Saul goes to her, and she brings up uh, Samuel from the dead, and it's, it's pictured as a soul. Uh, why this happens and how it happens, we don't know. I mean, uh, there, there are things we don't know about the Bible. Uh, the book of Revelation speaks of the souls of them that had been beheaded for the sake of the Lord Jesus. And so... Right, and Paul also mentions the earthly tent. Now, a yeah. tent would seem to indicate that it's housing something. We, we do not have enough data, I think, to, to speculate. What we can say is that the Bible definitely doesn't go along with the idea of the Greek idea of an impersonal spirit world. Um, the spirits are all personal beings, and souls are personal beings. Uh, they're corporeal. Um, how they can be that way, uh, we don't know. I'll tell you what, uh, this is... Um uh, discussion we could spend an hour on, but yeah. it's, it's kind of getting off of what we were originally talking about. We're rapidly running out of time. I wanted to get to Hugh Ross's uh, critique. I'm, I'm using him as kind of the, the figurehead for the entire Old Earth movement. Uh -huh. But they would, uh, in fact, I've heard Hugh Ross claim that this idea that the Hebrew word yom, when preceded by, uh, by the way, the Hebrew word yom meaning day, uh, when it's preceded by a number, in other words, the first day, the second day, always means a literal 24-hour day. You can't say it means eons or years or something like that. It's not 
being used in figurative sense. He would say that this argument used by young earth creationists is not correct. Uh, that, in fact, you can use the Hebrew word yom with a number preceding it and still have it mean these big, long time spans. Is that correct? Well, I think the answer is easy. The answer is uh, no, it, it, he's wrong, and you can test it with a concordance. Uh, the only place where Ross, I know in print, has come up with an exception is in the book of Hosea, where it talks about the second or third day, and it's interesting that that's the passage the apostle sees on to point to the resurrection of Jesus on the third day. Mm -hmm. So there's really no evidence for that. Ross is, is trying to resurrect the state of apologetic uh, rapport uh, before 1960 when uh, the strict creationism really got going in America. And uh, so not, those arguments have been answered time and time again. Now, I've noticed um, uh, that in this discussion, Hugh Ross is constantly, in fact, I've, I've actually read in a book where there was an old earth creationist that was making his argument for the scenario of the creation or of the origin of, of, of the earth, that he would first give the scientific scenario that, that would talk about the, the cloud of gas that gathered together and so forth like that. And then he would, he went through this whole uh, scenario, this whole theory, and then he, this is what he said. I've got it underlined in the book. He said, now let's take the text of Scripture and see how we can make it fit this scenario. <laughs> now, there seems to be a pattern here where people from the old earth perspective are saying, let's look at science and then see how we can make the Bible fit that. And what I'm hearing you say is, let's look at Scripture and see how we can make science fit that. Uh, Precisely. Lee, the whole, in a nutshell, here's what's happened. Christians have struggled with the rise of historical science for two or three hundred years. During this last two or three hundred years, every one of these arguments has been looked at again and over and over and over. And that's why in 1960, when Whitcomb and Morris wrote the Genesis Flood, they said, look, we've gone through two or three hundred years of trying to harmonize historical science and scripture, and we have failed. We have failed. Liberals know this. That's why they throw the Bible out and, and develop their theology out of thin air. We can't. We know that the Bible is the Word of God, so therefore, we've got to conclude, and it's a tough conclusion, particularly for people in the academic world, we have got to conclude that the Bible is correct, we've been wrong in our strategy for two or three hundred years, and we've got to start all over by subduing the so-called secular areas with the data of Scripture. We have to start explicitly with the authority of Scripture. Now, previously, Christians would do this ethically. What we're saying, we do it epistemologically, scientifically, and historically. Well, okay. This is, uh, I, I quite often hear this discussion that we, we know this because of science, and this is said over against what's said that's put forth in the text. But science itself is, is actually uh, empiricism, uh, or a branch of empiricism, which, as I understand it, philosophically says we can't know anything. All we have is probabilities. In other words, science is human observation, which may be extremely accurate, but mm -hmm. it, is, it just stands until we have another scientific theory to come along, whereas the Word of God is the creator of the universe telling us the answers to these questions. And... I guess at this point I'm, I'm asking you to tell me if I'm right in assuming that we actually have an authority problem such that yes, we your, do. your authority is either going to be the observations of man or what God is telling you about yeah, this. Yeah, yes, we do. And a, and a quick uh, illustration of that is Hugh Ross's arguments all depend upon mo the structure that modern physics has cranked out in the cosmological realm. And Dr. Russell Humphreys, uh, who works at Los Alamos Laboratories, has just come out with a book, uh, Starlight and Time, in which he can show, using the same relativistic arguments of Ross, if you substitute data from the text of Genesis 1, you come out with a young Earth. So this is interesting. It's not a matter of we're arguing against facts, or we're even arguing against observations. No, it's well, interpretation. the interpretation. Yes, the interpretation of those observations. In other words, we have science as observation, what we can see, you know, with our five senses, and then at that point, when you interpret what those observations mean, that is dependent upon your worldview, which Absolutely. is either going to be secular or biblical. You can take a math equation, y equals ax plus b, mm -hmm. and think about that equation. To make the equation work, you have got to put content into a and b. 
And exactly at the point that you load content into that mathematical equation, at that point, you're introducing your philosophic assumptions. Okay. Um, all right. So we have these observations, and of course, it's the, it's it's our worldview that determines uh, that determines how we're going to what our in, what our interpretation of these observations is going to be, what we what conclusion that we draw from these. But you said something else I thought was, that was very exciting. You'd said that Henry Morris and John Whitcomb had come out with an actual based on the text and supplemented with with scientific observation the the actual events of the world, uh, talking about the, the flood. But now you're saying that we actually have someone who has done the same thing in the field of astronomy, that's actually correct. actually leaving the bounds of the Earth and talking about the universe as a whole. That's correct. Well, that's, that's, that's very exciting, yes, and it, it all is. has to do with your, with your assumptions. In other words, how you're interpreting what we already see. So he would be answering such questions as, how is it that, that we can have these apparent long distances and huge amount of time? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, he answers it all. He okay. gave a paper at Pittsburgh on this, uh, uh, was peer-reviewed. Well, thank you very much for joining us. This has been a very good uh, yeah, discussion. We really appreciate it. We want to have you back. Okay, and, and talk about this uh, more. We've run out of time in this particular hour. Our guest has been Charles Clough. He has earned degrees in, uh, from Massachusetts Institute of Technology, from Dallas Seminary, in both theology and in meteorology and we've been talking about the age of the earth and usher's number the unique approach that we're going to be taking this hour or what i consider the unique approach is that we're going to be going to the scriptures to find out what the bible says <laughs> oh I mean, no not the scriptures yeah we, we first have to figure out what we think and then see if scripture lines up with it no right. we're going to uh toss aside uh, respectfully, the reasoning of man and, and his rationalism, we're going to see what Scripture says. I mean, this is the book by God to man. It, chances are very good. We're going to somewhere in here find uh, the answer to questions like this. And our guest is Jay Adams. He has written a book called The Grand Demonstration. Dr. Adams, how are you this afternoon? You're a little quiet, but I can hear you. <laughs> we'll try to speak up. Um, thank you very much for, for joining us. Uh, We've got just a few minutes before the break. Uh, briefly tell us about your book, Grand Demonstration. Well, I, first of all, I do agree with what you said about the rabbi. Uh, uh, there are only two alternatives. Either God is out of control or God has somehow or other brought evil about for some reason. And this book deals with the latter question, that mm -hmm. God has ordained evil, that the world is not out of his control, and it would be a horrible thing if it were out of his control at this most important, on this most important issue of all. Mm-hmm. So your book, uh, in reading it, I've been—I I really enjoyed it because it's very easy reading. It's not, again, uh, another advantage to it being biblically based is it's easy to read. You don't have to follow these long lines of logic and had a course in philosophy and so forth. Uh, you say that Scripture itself has a very simple answer to this problem. Uh, briefly describe for us what y your conclusions are. According to Romans nine and uh, we'll probably take a look at some of those verses after the break. Yes. Uh, Paul says that God wanted to demonstrate his own nature, and that his nature has two sides to it that he wanted to demonstrate. He wanted to demonstrate his power and wrath on the one side. He wanted to demonstrate his mercy and grace and goodness on the other. Now, without evil, neither of those could have been demonstrated. Uh, you can't have wrath unless you have some evil or some sin uh, that that wrath is poured out on. Hmm. You can't have uh, grace unless somebody needs grace, hmm. so there has to be evil. Right, and, and this brings a, a very interesting question to mind. How do you distinguish between black and white if there's only gray? Hmm. How do you know what is good if there is no evil? Right. Uh, that's a good point. In fact, um, something else I guess you could say along the same lines is we who can see know what is meant by colors. Someone who has been blind all their life has, doesn't make any sense to him at all and right. yet we can't imagine not knowing what a color is. Uh, and that I guess is the approach Dr. Adams that, that you're taking in this this book that the text in Romans 9 is saying that aside from uh, evil there's no way that we could know these aspects of God, if I could, for lack of a better term, uh, the, the 
the, the justice attributes. of God and, and the love of God, the mercy of God and the, the wrath of God. That's certainly what uh, Paul says in Romans 9. <clears throat> the question comes up when he says, I love Jacob, but I hated Esau. Mm -hmm. And then somebody raises the issue uh, in verse 14, what shall we say that is God unjust? Of course not, Paul says. And then he mentions the fact that uh, God says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have pity on whom I have pity. And then he quotes uh, uh, the scripture that says to Pharaoh, for this very reason I raised you up, so I could demonstrate, as that word means, my power by you. Just as he said in John 9, that uh, the man who was born blind that, he, that Christ healed was uh, not be, uh, blind because of what his parents did or what he did, but that the works of God might be made manifest in him. And so here he's saying the same thing about uh, Pharaoh. Then the issue comes, uh, you will say to me then, verse 19, uh, why does he still blame people who can resist his will? If God has raised people up for this purpose, uh, you know, this, this certainly isn't fair, is it? And uh, he goes on to, uh, to discuss that issue. Uh, that's the question that, that raises the rebuke that he brings and then the reason that he gives. The rebuke is, look, uh, God's a potter. He made us. It's like a, a, a lump of clay. He can make one pot for uh, decorative use, another pot for menial use. And then he, then he gives, and who are you to, to talk against it? That's the, uh, uh, the rebuke he gives. Who are you to the pot to say to the potter, why have you made me this way? God's a creator. He can do what he wants with his creation. It's the first thing. And we don't like to hear that because as sinners, we think we're more important than God. Right. And uh, we think God is less important than we are. That's a God uh, of Plato. Pardon me? That's a God of Plato. Exactly, and that's the kind of way we're born. But then he goes on to give the reason why God brought evil into the world. And he says in verse 22, What if God, wishing to demonstrate his wrath and to make known his power, endured with great patience the vases of wrath fitted for destruction, in order to make known the riches of his glory toward the vases of mercy that he designed beforehand for glory even us whom he called. So he's saying that apart from evil, and its presence, and his, his raising up people whose hearts would be hardened and whose hearts would be transformed by the Spirit of God to enable them to believe and receive his grace and mercy, that he would not be able to demonstrate his wrath and make his power known. He would not be able to make the riches of his glory known and his mercy and his goodness. But God did raise up people, and he did bring these two things to pass so that he could manifest his own nature. Now, the interesting thing is, who is watching? Well, not only human beings, but angels. Constantly through the Bible, we're taught that angels are watching what God is doing in this plan of redemption. We're just a little speck in the universe. Who knows how many creatures there are out there? The Bible distinguishes cherubim, seraphim, angels, a variety of names that are given. There may be all kinds of people just watching what's going on. Uh, on this little speck where God chose to make his power and his wrath as well as his mercy and grace known. That's interesting. I mean, we, we tend to be so, I guess, even as a race, so egocentric that we never think about the rest of God's creation and other, right. the, the multitudes of the heavenly hosts. And like you said, you know, several distinctions within uh, what we would kind of lump together as, as the angelic host. Right. And in the book of Revelation, for example, you have several of them distinguished from one another. What we usually call angels are really... Uh, a number of, of different uh, groups of beings. And even among the angels, there are differences. There are fallen angels, there are good angels, there are angels, there are archangels, there are strong angels, according to the Bible. Hmm. So uh, you have a variety, and there are myriads, uh, as the Greek says, of, of angels. So we've got quite an audience. And the interesting thing is, is that you and I are part of that drama, that grand demonstration of God's nature. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's happening in our lives isn't just something that's happening to us. Isn't just something that's happening in the human race. It's something that's happening in the universe that God has chosen to demonstrate to all of his creatures. Now, wouldn't Job be a, a perfect example of this? Here you have Job down on the earth, and you have God sitting on his throne up in heaven, and then Satan going to and fro upon the earth, and he comes up to God, and God says, Well, have you considered my servant Job? And then Job goes through all this suffering just to show and, you know, to, to give glory to God. Yeah, and God, God uh, deals with the issue by speaking to it, 
uh, saying that he is powerful in those last ver- chapters of the book of Job, where he, who were you, and mm-hmm. where were you, and all this he keeps saying, uh, showing man his insignificance and showing, uh, uh, himself, showing himself as the powerful, almighty God of creation and providence. And uh, then in the end, it comes out right for Job, doesn't it? Hmm. Yes, it does. And this is an interesting point that you've brought up uh, quite, you know, if you're having a discussion with someone who doesn't seem to think that uh, God demonstrating himself is a good reason for evil, uh, you know, God demonstrating himself to us that are either uh, going to be saved or going to be lost, as you pointed out, it's not necessarily to us only that, that God is, is demonstrating himself. It's, it's uh, Jim, as you pointed out, the, uh, has to do with demonstrating himself to fallen angels as well as to elect angels. And so there, there's a much larger scope than even we tend to, to imagine. Now, I want to get back to something that you had mentioned right. about, uh, okay, we know the purpose for evil existing, and even, as you had mentioned, God bringing evil into the world. Okay, what are we saying at this point? Are we saying that God has created evil? or? Well, evil is not a substance like uh, the material world around us that was created by God, the water, the sky, the seas, uh, the, the earth, and so on, or beings. Uh, Evil is a relationship of uh, human beings toward God and toward one another. Uh, it's, it's when we do those things which are out of accord with God's will, according to Scripture. And uh, that's what evil is. And he brought that kind of a situation into being where people would not always uh, do those things that please him. Now, I want to get into the details of that. Um, we're probably going to have to wait until after the break because sure. I want to... I want to first bring up uh, an objection that is commonly brought against what you're talking about, mm-hmm. God God actually having a purpose for evil, and that is the implication that God is somehow responsible for it. I'm specifically talking about James chapter 1, where... Uh, attempt. Right. There's, there's, God does not tempt anyone to evil. God is... Essentially, the passage seems to be saying God is not responsible for evil. How would you... Um, how would you, I, I guess... If I can go ahead and imply there's a contradiction here, how would you reconcile these these two passages? There's no problem whatsoever. Uh, God doesn't do the tempting. It's Satan and his crowd that does the tempting. God is the one who ordained that these things would occur, in, in, but he, doesn't, he, he is not the one who does it. Mm-hmm. Um, and God has ordained that these things will take place in such a way that responsible creatures, men and angels, will do things for which they are held guilty and justly held guilty, not forced into what they're doing, but though ordained, it's not just the end that's ordained, it's the means that is ordained. Mm -hmm. And we can get into that past your break if you care to. Okay, well, just uh, briefly, I guess, I I would like to talk about, the listener is going to have in his mind, I guess, that we're kind of speaking out of both sides of our mouth and saying sure. that God has, on one hand, ordained something, but on the other, the other hand, he's not the one who does it. And, uh, well, uh, again, this hour we're speaking with Jay Adams. I uh, want to mention that Jay Adams is right now pastor of Harrison Bridge Road Associate Reform Presbyterian Church. Now, that takes up two lines in the phone book, <laughs> I bet. He's uh, taught at Westminster Seminary, both Westminster East and Westminster West. Uh, he has degrees from Reformed uh, Episcopal Seminary and also Temple University School of Theology. He has his Ph.D. from the University of Missouri. His book is The Grand Demonstration. It's uh, dealing with the so-called problem of evil from a biblical standpoint. We're not mm-hmm. dealing with syllogisms and rationalism. We're actually getting into what the, the text says. And the text uh, at this point would seem to be very, very clear uh, right uh, now. I'm Lee, sorry. may I make a comment before we get into it? Sure. Uh, Mike Horton, whose works you were advertising, was a student of mine out there in Westminster Seminary. And oh, he's a, oh very, yeah. a very clever and very uh, fine individual, and mm. I think uh, I'd like just like to give him a plug. Oh, <laughs> yes. he's. Uh, we, we, we're scheduled to have him yes, on. Yes, we're working on that right now. We haven't got a definite date, but um, yeah. I have been working with his ministry on having him on the show. Sure. Mm. Go ahead. Well, uh, we're talking about the, the problem of evil, and specifically we're dealing with how can God ordain something, specifically evil, and yet not bear the responsibility for it. And I'm just going to go ahead and let you go with that. It's interesting you ask that question, and it's also interesting that that question is in the minds of many people who are listening today, I'm sure, because that's the question that Paul says people will ask. Hmm. You will say to me then, he says in Romans 9, 19, 
Why does he still blame people who can resist his will? If God has ordained that certain people are going to have eternal life and others eternal damnation, and some will sin and harden their hearts and others will receive his grace, why does he blame them? Why does he resist their will? Uh, just before I answer that question in Paul's words, let me make the point that if the Arminianism or the other doctrines that might be uh, taught that try to take the, the uh, edge off of what Paul is asking here, uh, is saying here in this passage... Let's define our terms uh, before you go any further. Arminians... Okay, that would be people who do not believe that God has ordained evil and uh, ordained all things that take place. Uh, but the, the person who asked this question, Paul says, will ask it uh, because, you see, Paul has said something that's cons that brings up this issue. Uh, if people ask this question, then it's uh, of what I'm saying, then obviously I'm saying what Paul said. Because you will say to me, he says, then, who can resist his will? Why does he find fault? And that's exactly what people say. So it, it, it demonstrates that this is what Paul was really saying. Now, what does he say? He says that God, uh, wishing to demonstrate his wrath and make his power known, and in order to make the riches of his glory known through the vase of mercy, endured and then also gave that kind of grace to them and designed them beforehand for glory. The... The point is, is that God does not merely ordain the end, as I was saying earlier. That's where people get confused. They think, all right, somebody's ordained to go to hell. Somebody's ordained to go to heaven. No and matter what true. you do, you can't change it. Right. Well, and that's true. If God is ordained, it isn't going to be changed. Right. What God knew from all eternity will happen. He didn't know error or falsehood or know something that was uh, uncertain. What God knew is what, uh, what it was ordained. And, and God knew it before there was a human being or anything else. And so there wasn't anybody else but God to ordain it. Now, uh, if God knew it, then how can we resist his will? Well, the point is, is that God did also ordain the means by which these ends would take place. And the means was to create responsible human beings, as human beings who would not be pushed into doing what they're doing, but who would make decisions for which they were responsible. That was the means. Let, let me tell you the difference between uh, Muslim thinking, which is fatalism, and biblical thinking, which is predestination. Uh, Muslims say you're going to get it on such and such a day at such and such a corner by being run over by a car, regardless of what you do. Mm -hmm. The predestinarian, nevertheless, says you're going to get it on such and such a day on such and such a corner by being run over by the car because of what you did. You were watching that girl cross the street instead of the stoplight. Mm. So one is a responsible view. The other is a not responsible view. It's just kismet, fate. Okay. But, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, but people make responsible decisions. And you can decide to crook your finger or uncrook your finger right now as you're sitting there listening. And uh, you don't feel any compulsion to do one or the other. So God has made you the kind of person who will make decisions and these decisions will be what he has ordained, not apart from your decision-making, but precisely because of it and through it. Now, I noticed in your, your book that you speak extensively of the uh, Reformed-slash-Calvinistic view of, of predestination. Right. Uh, is that intimately connected with your theodicy such that, uh, uh, in other words, this is a theodicy that is inconsistent with the Arminian position? Yes. You cannot have a view of the scriptures in which God is sovereign, unless you understand what the Bible says about predestination, which is a biblical term. Mm -hmm. Over eight times in the New Testament, the word predestination is used, or predestined in the form of the verb, and uh, uh, other places say the same thing without using that word. Well, okay, at this point I would really like to get into close or carefully defining Calvinism and Arminianism because right. I know that the problem is not that people aren't familiar with these terms. The problem is people think that they are and they quite often have got a, a misconception of, of, of what they mean. So right. define and, Calvinism. And also I want to throw in a third, uh, the other extreme, hyper-Calvinism. Right. Yeah, perhaps that would help us clarify our definition of Calvinism and Arminianism. Calvinism believes that God is sovereign God has control over all things because he himself has ordained all things and created them. 
and that he is providentially bringing to pass all the things that he has ordained through the proper means, namely through responsible choices and decisions of human beings who are not created as automatons or little toy soldiers that you wind up that beat the drum, but who were created as people who will make decisions out of their own nature. Well, you've probably all... You've probably already uh, uh, confused some people who think that Calvinism is something that says that, that God either completely goes against man's free will or he has no free will or uh, there is no uh, volition in man. He's just kind of a little wind now up. That's kind of the hyper-Calvinism of which you were talking. That's going to happen regardless, mm -hmm. and man isn't all that responsible one way or another. That's yeah, so not there's, no re there's no reason to preach right. uh, the gospel. Right. Or... You just sit and wait for people to get saved. Right. But we believe in the means, that God has ordained the means every bit as much as the ends. But yet we're not saying by Calvinism that God's predestinating purposes are something that are built around somebody's response or that he has, uh, in other words, a lot of people interpret the word predestination in the Bible to mean God predicted that this person would respond positively if given the gospel. So he predestines those who he knows will say will respond in faith to the gospel to be saved. He predestines those who he knows will respond negatively to the gospel to be lost. Uh, this is not Calvinism. God didn't look down the corridors of history and see who was going to believe and who wouldn't and then ordain. Okay. That, that's what you're saying. Exactly. That's true. His free uh, uh, freedom to do as he pleases is, is a perfect freedom and an absolute freedom. Uh, he can act as free as uh, he wants to be according to his own nature. God is free, and man is free to act according to their natures. Uh, I can't act according to somebody else's nature or a nature I don't have. God can't do that. The Bible says God can't lie because he, that's against his nature. And uh, a human being who is born a sinner and who has a, 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 a nature that will only respond in such a way as to be displeasing to God will act freely according to that nature, but he isn't free to do good. He's only free to do evil. Once he is redeemed, the Spirit of God has regenerated him and given him a new uh, capability. He is now free to do what God wills. That's what Romans 6 and 7 is all about. Okay, well, um, we're, this is a very good definition. I want to continue with this, but, uh, but we do have a call from Alan, and we'll see what Alan has to add to the discussion. Go ahead, Alan. You're on the air. Hi, Alan. Hi. Thank you very much. Uh, and Jay Adams? Yeah. Okay, uh, I've enjoyed the discussion so far, although I would like to take issue with a couple of things. That's fine. That's great. Mm -hmm. Okay. First one is, uh, you know, you were talking about uh, human beings as just sort of like little meaningless specks in the universe. And, uh, you know, certainly that's not the way we feel about our children and, uh, and about the way we, the people we love. And it's not the way God feels about us, I don't think. He it says God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son I mean, I think God loves us, and we're not meaningless little specks. May I respond to that before you get to your second sure. objection? Sure. All right. Uh, if you're saying that John 3.16 and kindred verses are saying that God sent his Son because we were so valuable, then you've just denied the doctrine of grace. Grace teaches that though we were sinners, enemies, everything else, and there was nothing desirable in us, that God, out of his own free initiative, determined to do good to certain people, and did. Uh, you've got to be careful with the self-esteem, self-love, self-worth movement. I haven't got time to get in that today, but I have a whole book on it. Uh, it's teaching wrong things, and one of the things that many people in that movement, not all, one of the things that many of them teach is that man was so valuable that God had to save him. That just denies the whole doctrine of grace, and you've got to be careful there. Well, that's what, not what I'm saying, but, you know, when God finished his creation, he looked upon it and he said, it is good. Yeah, but he was talking about himself. He wasn't talking about the creation as being such a wonderful thing in and of itself. He was talking about the very great job he had done in creating such a, a creation. Well, but I mean, I, I mean, I look at the, uh, the universe. I look at sunsets. I look at, right. at all the a beautiful newborn baby, and right. I say they're beautiful, and I love them. And, and oh, that's I think, fine, yeah. Okay, now the next thing, uh, this, the man born blind. Right. Now, to say that God made that man or, or, or blinded that baby before it was born just so Jesus could work a miracle, I think is, uh, I mean, I, I don't accept that. What did the passage say? Well, 
Okay, read it. Read it again. Do you have it handy? I'm afraid I my Bible's. Uh, I've got Neither a of... did this man sin, nor his parents, including the King James. That's the only one I memorized. Yeah. Uh, that he was born blind, but that the works of God might be made manifest in him. God wanted to manifest the glory of His Son Jesus Christ, as He does all through the Book of John, showing His glory, and uh, that's why that man was there well, in that okay. condition. Here, here's what I think, and my I, I don't think it contradicts the Bible. I think if Adam and Eve had, had not sinned, there wouldn't be all the uh, children born mentally retarded and blind and handicapped and uh, all that sort of thing. I think that That's is true. part of the fall. We have fallen natures, and our DNA gets all screwed up. That's true. And but I think, that's, that's not apart from God's ordination and providence. Yes, but I think Jesus is going to make us all. I mean, all of us right now, the, 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 the four of us talking, uh, we are all uh, we are all damaged merchandise, right? And Jesus is going to make us all whole, just like He made the blind man whole. And and we are all uh, it's because God loves us that He's going to do that, uh, because Jesus loves us that He's going to do that. Uh, and and it's, you could say that because it's because Adam and Eve fumbled the ball that we are damaged merchandise, not that God wanted us to be damaged. God Whoa. wanted Adam and Eve to, to not to sin. God did not, well, God wanted, that. he loved uh, paradise, he loved Adam and Eve. They are the ones that destroyed the relationship. They destroyed that relationship, yes, through the uh, providence of God and in accordance with his plan so that his nature might be made manifest the vessels of wrath that were fitted for destruction, and toward, uh, to show his grace and mercy toward those vases that he designed for glory. Uh, you can't have the one without the other. You've either got a universe that's out of God's hands and running or, or along and there's, uh, on its own, and uh, you have no assurance that the promises of God are really going to hold true or any of the rest of it because he's a God who's let his universe get out of his hands, and uh, he may be just giving you what he'd like to see happen, but it may not really happen at all. Or you've got a God who's in control, and none of this is out of his hands. And well, you've got to remember that God knew everything that was going to take place. Indeed, Christ's death was ordained from the found before the foundation of the world. Why would have Christ have to die uh, in the plan and purpose of God before there was a human being if God did not know that uh, b human beings were going to sin? and need the death of Christ to redeem them. No reason whatsoever. And who made it certain? Certainly it was certain. God does no uncertainty. There was only God before the creation and the foundation of the world. So God made it certain. It was certain. But God also ordained that he would do it through human beings that would make responsible decisions, not apart from that. But in defining Calvinism, uh, a lot of people have in their mind uh, that Calvinism is something that Calvin invented and a few people still hold to it, but it's been kind of a minority view in Christianity. But that's not true. It's actually fundamental to the Reformation itself. Yeah, even Luther was a Calvinist, you might say. Uh, he wrote a book called The Bondage of the Will that's uh, every bit more Calvinistic than anything Calvin ever wrote. Hmm. And actually, we always think of the Reformation as uh, the, the idea coming forth or, or, or being brought back, actually, that we're saved by grace alone through faith alone. But this is actually something that came out of Luther's view of predestination. Right, exactly. And, uh, you know, the, the Reformed faith, as uh, Calvinism is often called, is... Uh, the word reform comes from reformation. Mm -hmm. It was the faith of all the reformers. Luther, right. Calvin, Zwingli, all the, the key reformers believed that, and it was only later on that people like Arminius came along and challenged that, and uh, the five points of Calvinism, so-called, are really only five responses to the five challenges of Arminius. Well, that matter, uh, Calvinism, if we want to still call it that, actually predates the uh, the Reformation, predates the Catholic Church, I guess. It goes back to the Apostle Paul <laughs> yeah. and uh, <laughs> Moses, for that matter. Yeah. And uh, But it's interesting, even the uh, uh, Augustine was a, a very strong mm. believer in uh, predestination and so on. Yes, and of, of course, 
since the Reformation, uh, it was all the way up until, I guess, uh, the Wesley brothers that the church was almost exclusively Calvinistic. And even beyond that, the Wesley brothers were kind of a, a limited view in Christianity until, I guess, the 19th century and, and especially the 20th century. That's correct. And a lot of problems have grown out of what they did and said. Hmm. Well, okay, uh, contrast for us uh, briefly. We're just about out of time. Contrast for okay. us Calvinism and Arminianism. Well, Calvinism makes God sovereign over all things. Arminianism makes him sovereign over some things, but allows man to have a will of his own that God is not sovereign over, and that's a critical issue. Hmm. And this uh, idea that uh, it's often said that I'm not an Arminian. I've heard people say this. I'm not an Arminian uh, because I believe that uh, predestination means that God simply looked down through the corridors of time. Yeah. And, uh, uh, well, you are but, if you believe that. And, and see, that's, that's the confusion people seem to have. They don't realize that is Arminianism. Foreknowledge is God's knowledge of what he himself has planned. Mm -hmm. God doesn't learn anything by uh, trying to find out what's going to happen in days to come. That's a very wrong concept of foreknowledge. Foreknowledge is, uh, is knowing what he has planned, and therefore uh, he's well informed. And it's only by knowing these things that we can truly understand why evil exists. And also, right. is there such a thing as a Calminian? Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> I think three... that's a contradiction in terms. You go for one of the five points of Calvinism, and if you think it through, you've got to accept all the other four. Yeah, or, or you know, I've heard three-and-a-half-point Calvinist yeah. or yeah. three-point Calvinist. That, that's right. always, but anyway. Well, thank you very much for being on the show. Hey, it was good talking to you, yeah. fellas. I wish you the Lord's blessing. Thank you for joining us for Christian Answers Live, an outreach of Christian Answers Incorporated. We hope that you've enjoyed the show. Be sure to join us again next time when we'll be responding to the world's questions with Christian answers. Check out our websites, BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com. This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available.